Welcome back everyone. In today's video, I'm going to be ranking the books in the Chronicles of Narnia series. I've just finished my reread of the series, haven't read it in a very long time since I was much younger, and I'm glad to say that having read it again much later, some of my opinions on some of the books in this series have changed quite a bit. Some of the books I really didn't care for that much the first time actually proved to be way more interesting the second time around. So let's get into it. At number 7 we have Prince Caspian, which is the second book in the series if we're taking publication order, or the third book in the series if we're taking it in chronological order. This is the second book that features the four Pavensi children, and unfortunately it's the last book that they all share together, which is a shame because it's really not all that good. I don't like this book too much because I see it as a rehash of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe in a lot of ways. The Pevensi children feature again, they save Narnia from a tyrant again, and the tyrant is just, you know, evil because evil again. So there's just lots of themes that are the same from before, and that's why this comes down lower, because I think it's the least original, the least distinctive book in the series. There are some good things about this book though, and I don't think this or any of the books in the series is really all that bad. But well, the good things in this book are Susan's character arc, because she actually gets a bit of development here, where she is doubting about Narnia and she doesn't really want to be there. And this kind of foreshadows one of the controversial things that happens with her character later. Also, we do get the introduction of Prince Caspian, who becomes a key character in some of the later books, and I do like his character a lot. And lastly, I think the opening of this book is really good, when the children come back to Narnia and they slowly work out that that's where they are, they see the ruins of Cape Power Vale and they start exploring, all that stuff is really good. It's just a shame that the rest of the book doesn't live up to that great introduction. At number six we have The Magician's Nephew, which is the first book in chronological order and the sixth book in terms of publication order. It's worth saying that at this point it becomes much harder for me to rank these books because I actually think that Prince Caspian aside they're all really good and really worth reading. It's also surprising to me that The Magician's Nephew has come down this far because this was one of the books that I really liked growing up, but now having grown up and now reading the series again, I do think it is lacking in some key areas. Essentially, this book gives us the origin story of Narnia, covers its creation by Aslan, and in giving us this origin story, it also tells us the origins of some of the things from the later books, such as the White Witch and the Lamppost, as well as obviously Narnia itself. The problem with some of this backstory is that I feel like it causes more problems than it solves. I actually quite like the mystery of Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, and I feel like those things are better left said, and the explanations that Lewis gives here some sort of create problems for some of his other aspects of his world. For instance, Diggory and Polly, the children in this book, go to Narnia using magic rings, and their uncle, who is an adult, and the White Witch eventually as well, they all get to Narnia by using these rings as well. Now in the very last book, these rings come back into the story again, and the children mention that only Polly and Eustace can use these rings because they're young enough to use them. But if Polly and Diggory's uncle could use the ring, he's an adult, why can't the adults or the older children in the last book use the rings? So this is just one thing that I realised rereading it, this little plot hole that I don't really get. And there are a couple of others as well. Also, aside from just giving us an origin story, I don't think this particular volume contributes that much in terms of the overall Chronicles of Narnia story. That being said, there is a lot of great stuff in here. We've got the journey to the White Witch's original world, Charn, and its destruction. We've also got the creation story which I think is really beautifully written and I think it's one of the things that Lewis does really well, these kind of really magical imaginative scenes. Also it's set in the Victorian times which gives it a bit of a distinctive feel from some of the other books. And finally it's also way more light-hearted which is really nice because if you think about this in terms of publication order the next book, The Last Battle, is pretty dark so it's a nice contrast to have this lighter, brighter story which reflects the light beginning of Narnia, and then the last battle is the end of Narnia, but it's much darker. So I like that. I like that it's a lighter book, um, but it's being lighter does let it down in terms of being a more substantial entry in the series. At number five, we have The Horse and His Boy, which is the fifth book in publication order and the third book chronologically. Horse and His Boy is a weird one because it is basically a standalone book that takes place in between the events of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and Prince Caspian, and it takes place during the Pevensi children's reign in Narnia. It tells the story of Shasta and Bree, Shasta being the boy, Bree being the horse, and their journey from a desert land to Narnia. And also they meet a princess and her horse along the way. Like I said, this is one of the more unique entries in the series, and when I've looked at people's discussions of the series, 
It's also one of the books that some people seem to think it's one of the best and other people seem to think it's one of the worst. People who think it's less good tend to argue that it's kind of an essential to the series, a point which I do have some sympathy with, but I kind of also agree with the people who think it's a, a great book because they argue that yes it doesn't contribute much to the series but it is one of the more unique entries, it's an interesting story. I remember when I read this when I was much younger thinking it was probably the worst in the series because it just seems so out of the narrative. But actually on reread, I did like it quite a lot. The only thing that holds it back is that I just like the other books that are still yet to come more than this one. In fact, I would say that of all the books, it's probably the most middle of the road. I don't have anything overly negative to say or overly positive to say, and that's why it's more or less in the middle. Moving on now to number four, we have The Last Battle, which is both the last book chronologically and the last book in publication order. So this is the final book and it tells the end, the destruction of Narnia, and it's also one of the most controversial books for a few reasons. One, it's much darker in tone than the other ones. The, the main characters basically all die in a train crash, so, you know, pretty dark for a kid's book. Also, we get the controversial exclusion of Susan, who is described as no longer a friend of Narnia in this book. Usually people tend to rate this as one of the worst books in the series, and I have to say, when I was younger, this was the book that I I think the very first time I read the series, I just gave up on it because it just didn't interest me as much. And when I did read it, I just felt like it was too dark, too depressing. And I didn't really like what happened with Susan's character either. Now though, having reread it, uh, reread the series, I think that this is probably the most underrated book in the series. Firstly, I thought that the writing at the end of this book was some of the most beautiful writing in the whole series. I mentioned when I was talking about The Magician's Nephew, that Lewis is really good at doing these kind of creation stories and really getting your imagination going and capturing the beauty of those kinds of things. And I think he does it here as well, in those final moments where Narnia is destroyed and the stars go out and Father Time emerges from the ground. Just that whole kind of uh, scene, or several scenes, are just really beautiful writing and quite emotive as well. You know, this is an imaginary fantasy world that's coming to an end and the characters are transcending to an afterlife and I think Lewis just captures the magic and wonder of that transition beautifully. Now onto the elephant in the room, and that is the Susan problem, as people like to call it. Having reread the series, I actually thought that this whole <laughs> debacle around Susan's character is a bit overstated and a bit reactionary, really. First of all, I think it actually made sense for this to happen to Susan's character. We already had that moment in Prince Caspian where she was reluctant to be in Narnia, and she, you know, she, she wasn't very comfortable with being there. And so it makes sense that, you know, once she leaves again and she goes back into the world, that's something that's going to come back. So I think that Lewis did actually set this up quite well. A second thing worth mentioning is that a lot of people complain that the reason why Susan is kicked out of Narnia or she's no longer a friend is something to do with her discovering sex. I think that's what J.K. Rowling and also Philip Pullman, that's something that they've said about this. And I just think that's wrong. There is like an offhand comment about lipsticks and nylons, but Actually, it seems like the real reason why Susan doesn't come back to Narnia is because she is obsessed with growing up and putting away childish things. She thinks that it's silly to believe in Narnia. She wants to distance herself from it, and she wants to focus on material things and that all of that kind of stuff. It's nothing to do with <laughs> the with her sex life. Overall, then, I do think this is an underrated entry in the series. It's still got problems. I, don't really think the main setup of the plot is particularly inspired, and I do think that the plot itself, when they transition from, you know, the stuff with the monkey and the, and the, and the donkey, and then suddenly they're in the afterworld, and that just kind of happens really quickly. It doesn't feel like an earned ending. It just kind of becomes about the end of Narnia very quickly, and I, and I do think that's somewhat of a problem for the overall narrative arc. So I do think it does have some flaws. At number three, we have The Silver Chair, which is the fourth in publication order and the sixth in chronological order. So when I was younger, it was the BBC adaptations of these books that really got me into the series, especially the one of The Silver Chair, which was, at least back then, my favourite book. The Silver Chair tells the story of Jill Pohl and Eustace Scrub, who's back from the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, as they are called back to Narnia to seek out Prince William, who is Prince Caspian's son. They also travel with one of the best characters from the whole series, Puddleglum, who is a marsh wiggle, which is essentially a human-frog hybrid kind of thing, uh, who's incredibly pessimistic, but also really kind and funny. 
Travelling with them is one of my favourite characters from the whole series, and that's Puddleglum the Marshwiggle, who is really pessimistic, but deep down he has a heart of gold and he's really kind. He spends a lot of the story moaning and always thinking the worst about what's going to happen, and usually he proves wrong uh, most of the time. The main draw with this book is that I love the dynamic between these three characters. The Silver Chair is probably the most intimate in terms of the overall story. We just follow Jill, Eustace and Puddleglum going on this adventure, the three of them, and so we get a more nuanced set of relationships between these characters. I always felt reading the books that Jill and Eustace were some of the best fleshed out characters. And I also think their relationship with Puddleglum is really sweet. They're always bickering with each other because, you know, Puddleglum's so miserable and, the, and he kind of takes everything really seriously. And the children don't always do that. They get sick of adventuring and that leads them into <laughs> some problems. And they just have this really nice relationship. It is basically like a family traveling with, you know, the two kids and their <laughs> crazy eccentric uncle. So it's a really nice dynamic and it's probably my favorite dynamic in terms of the main characters and their relationships in the whole series. I also like the uniqueness of this one in terms of the overall series. We've got the setup with Aslan giving Jill signs that she has to follow, which will lead her to the prince. We also have the whole underworld thing, which is again just another bit of world building, which is not necessarily Lewis's strong point by any means, but it's nice when he adds in these new worlds. And he always leaves things open, which I really like. You know, most series, they like to give really concrete answers to things, but Lewis really likes to just leave everything open to the imagination. And so there's always a sense of mystery with these places because we never know too much about them. And so the underworld, for me at least, is one of the most interesting and still mysterious worlds that he creates. The only thing that really holds the silver chair back is that I think that the story overall is a bit more scaled back than the other two picks that, I, that are higher up on the list. It's a much more intimate story, which is great for character development and things like that, but it doesn't have the same sense of wonder, I think, that these other stories do. Okay, so at number two, we have the first book in publication order and the second book in chronological order, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So this is the story that everyone will know if they've heard of Narnia, you will definitely have heard of this story at least. And it is still, I would say, the undisputed classic of that series, even if it's not, in my view, the best that the series has to offer. If I was going based purely on my nostalgia, I might actually put The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe first, or maybe even The Magician's Nephew, which is weird given that quite low now, but this one and The Magician's Nephew really do have a huge, give me a huge sense of nostalgia, so that's partly probably why that this one is so high up. But I tried not to rely too much on nostalgia and just trying to go for more objective criteria and thinking about how good of a story is this. And I think even putting nostalgia aside as much as I can, Line the Witch in the Wardrobe is just one of the best books in the series. Lucy's slow discovery of Narnia and her relationship with Mr. Tumnus and then Edmund's going to Narnia and meeting the White Witch and being corrupted. All of that opening is just one of the best openings in the entire series. Edmund especially has probably one of the most complex character arcs in a single book in this one with his betrayal of his siblings and then his eventual redemption. We also have the White Witch, who is one of the best classic evil villains that I have come across, especially thinking of this in terms of children's literature. As well as that, she's probably one of the few villains in the Narnia series that I would say really came across as threatening. She was able to actually hold Narnia for so long under her spell. She was able to manipulate Edmund. She was able to kill Aslan. Like, she was a pretty effective villain. And if she hadn't, you know, if she just hadn't got caught up in her pride and need to kill Aslan, and then so he could be resurrected, she probably would have won. She was probably one of the most effective and best villains in the series, I would say. That being said, I do think the White Witch gets dispatched a little bit too quickly, and I don't really like the resolution to this story. I think it starts off really well, the middle is really good, and the battle resolution is, is less good. I, I don't think Lewis writes battle scenes very well, and I think most of the books that I prefer tend to be ones that don't have big battles in them, because he doesn't, you know, he doesn't really write in a very complex way, and I think to do battle writing well, you kind of want that degree of complexity to make it interesting and engaging. But other than that, this is just a captivating story. It still, after all these years, captivates my imagination. You know, Narnia is one of my favourite worlds. And again, not because it's complex, not because it's got a hard magic system that's really, really detailed and all that kind of stuff, but just because it has a certain mystery and wonder to it. And I think that's something that's quite overlooked in a lot of modern fantasy where people want 
detailed, you know, all of the details filled in and ha not have things kind of softer, more elusive, and left to the imagination. Not to say that any of those things are bad, I mean, I, I do like those things too, but when someone does a soft magic system, a kind of more open-ended world that's kind of vague, when people do that well, I think in a lot of ways it's better than having all of that complexity. And for me at least, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe is one of those books. And at number one, we have The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which was the third book in publication order, and the fifth book in chronological order. The reason why I think The Voyage of the Dawn Treader is the best book in the Chronicles of Narnia series is that it has all of the things that make the Narnia books really good, and very few to none of the things that make it bad. White Witch aside, and maybe The Green Witch a little bit, Lewis isn't very good at writing compelling villains. Unfortunately for us, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader doesn't really have an overarching villain. Instead what we have are, instead what we have is an adventure story where our characters are going to various islands and in every island they go to they have some kind of challenge. Usually this challenge tests the virtues of the travellers. So we have Eustace finding dragon treasure, confronting his greed, we have Lucy confronting her vanity, we have Edmund conf uh, confronting his jealousy, we have all of these various trials and I think this is really well done and again unique to the series which usually focuses on having a big bad that has to be overcome. It's also a big adventure story which I also think Lewis does really well when he's doing these adventures, kind of like with the horse and his boy, but I do think that the voyage of the Don Treader is better just because you have a much wider scope, because you're going to more places, you're going to all these islands, and every place that they go to feels like a distinctive place. The final thing that really sells this one for me are the characters. I really like the combination of characters in this one. We've got Reaper Jeep, the kind of brave, kooky mouse. We've got Caspian back again, but now slightly older, more mature, and therefore this creates an interesting dynamic between him and the children. We've got the introduction of Eustace, who starts off as this really annoying brat, and then slowly becomes a much nicer person. And we've got Lucy and Edmund, who are the best two Pimenti children, back again. Usually I find that when Lewis has more char main characters in the story, that does end up sacrificing some character development. And that is a bit true in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. I always felt like Susan and Peter weren't that developed in comparison to Lucy and Edmund. But in this one, even though we've got a lot of characters that we're following, I feel like they all have a moment to shine. And I think part of the reason for that is the story itself. What we have is then going to these islands and confronting these challenges. And usually these challenges focus on one of them. So every character has a thing, an obstacle to overcome and then they overcome it and become better. I do think Edmund gets a little bit sidelined in this one, but overall I think everyone gets a moment to shine in this book, which isn't something that can be said for most of the other ones, maybe except for The Silver Chair and The Magician's Nephew. Okay, so that is my ranking of the Chronicles of Narnia books. If you've read the series, please let me know what you think, especially uh, things like putting The Last Battle relatively high, because I do think that most people seem to think that's just the worst book, and either that or The Magician's Nephew tend to come at the bottom of people's lists. As always, it's always fun to discuss these things, people's different opinions, so if you do have a different opinion from me, let me know in the comments below. But that's it from me now though, so take care everyone, and I'll see you all next time. Next